All right, so the final objective is called, is about your future self. And um, when you think about, or when I think about my future self and who I want to be and who, I, who I'm striving to be, um, it often causes me to pause and hesitate. I know it makes other people feel that way too. And the, the challenge that I have had and that I know that many people have is when you, I, you conceptualize your future self and it can be, you, know, you have this big, beautiful, grandiose vision of who you are going to be and what you're going to do and the lives that you're going to impact and uh, all of these wonderful, you know, dreams and aspirations. But the, you know, the human side of us can begin to um, focus on this idea of perfection, right? Like, okay, well, I have this beautiful shiny um, vision of what I you know what my life is going to be like and it's going to be perfect um, and but those thoughts then start to lead to other thoughts about um, relation to the fact that like well I'm not perfect well I'm, I can't you know I don't know everything and I'm not as good as that person and who am I to think that I could, you know, that I could live that dream or be, you know, um, uh, be in charge of that business or run, you know, um, raise a, a, this beautiful family. And, um, and so this idea that everything that we have to do has to be exactly right, exactly perfect. If I don't do it exactly this way, then um, and it doesn't turn out exactly right, then I'm going to be a failure. That thought, those thoughts can lead us to holding back, right? When we feel, when we fear failure, when there's that pending aversive consequence, I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to be punished for it by, by failing, right? the motivation to act decreases. So there's and that, that fear of failure, that perceived sense that you're going to fail, essentially functions as an abolishing operation on our, um, on our response. So we are not going to act because if I act and I don't act exactly right, in exactly the right way, and I don't do exactly what needs to be done, you know, exactly how it needs to be done, the outcome is going to be perfect. Therefore, all of my efforts are going to be wasted. And I think about this a lot. I think about why, what were those experiences for myself? in my life, well, what were the um, things that happened around me and to me that caused me to develop these thought patterns? And I've thought about that a lot. And I have come to, you know, realized through my, you know, reflecting back about on my personal experiences and then also observing humans in general and, you know, involved with other people's families and in school environment and business environment, um, that we, sometimes we react to each other in such a way that um, leads to those thoughts. So if you see, you, know, you see something that somebody has done, and you, you know, you think it's fine, but you know, maybe it's not like what you would conceptualize as exactly right or exactly perfect. 
your verbal or nonverbal response to that individual might communicate that what they did wasn't perfect, which then, right, that communication, nonverbal and verbal communication, then gets perceived by that person. They reflect upon what they did, the quality of it. It wasn't, you know, the person that I was sharing this with didn't reciprocate my good feelings about it. They acted as if it wasn't good enough. Therefore, you know, I thought it was good enough, but this person I care about didn't think it was good enough, so it must not be good enough. I must be wrong because, you know, their opinion matters more than my opinion. And it's just this, you know, to be able to think about those things and think about those patterns of responses and human interaction and how, you know, when I share something with you and you reciprocate in whatever way your brain and your body, you know, um, reciprocates, that whatever nonverbal and verbal communication comes out of you then feeds back into my brain and um, either reinforces a pattern of behavior or punishes a pattern of behavior and then you know, leads to all sorts of um, situations. The sound is back to me again. Oh, it's here. Can I do it in here? Okay. Um, give me just a second. Okay, um, how is the sound now? Okay, all right, sorry about that. I have a sense that it has to do with our internet connection. So um, apologies for that. Uh, okay, so so we were talking about. I was just talking about you know, that that fear of failure and those those thought patterns that are kind of that are learned through our own actions and our own self talk, paired with our actions and the communication coming from other people in, in our environment, either nonverbal or verbal, which then um, triggers additional thoughts that can cause this cycle of hesitation. And so the, uh, in the Flip the Script book, this, the idea, the way that uh, Coit describes it is to flip, flip the script on being flawless, flip that idea of being flawless and really begin to focus on how we can, in our day-to-day -day lives, give more abundantly to our dreams and our goals and our aspirations, not in the effort of being perfect, but in the, in the effort of just working towards our end goal. So when we, when we learn how to break that hesitation cycle, when we, we can kind of like get out of our own minds and get into our lives, um, that can help break that, break that cycle, which leads to the hesitation and to the stagnation, which impacts many of us in, re in relation to our goal. We get so caught up in the here and now and kind of the rat race. We get so caught up in this idea like, okay, well, I can't put myself out there because if I... If I'm not absolutely perfect and everybody doesn't love me in every way, shape, or form, then it wasn't worth it. It's going to be too painful to experience that, right? And we actually come to grips with the idea that, with the fact that nobody is perfect. The, um, you know, the ideal models that we see out in the world of people who do things really, really well, that has come with 
time and effort and dedication and practice and you know their quote unquote perfection this perfect image of who they are and what they do did not come without effort it did not come without pain if you actually sat down with the people that we revere and hold you know hold high up on a pedestal and listen really listened and heard their story you wouldn't hear a story that was like i had a perfect childhood and then i thought well i'm gonna do this and then magically it happened you would hear a story of pain and strife and failure and um but what that what but what those people did do is not focus on being perfect but focused on giving fully every day to make gains and take steps towards the end goal and so for this objective what we're going to do or is to pick kind of a the single most important outcome in your life and kind of what you are thinking about what you care about notice any of the hesitation or second guessing and then um, you know think about the steps that you can take to live and give more abundantly through your effort and then really consider what are the benefits that you will receive by putting everything on the line. So it can be really scary when you have a big dream and you have a big goal and you have a big idea. Um, that is, you know, it usually means that it's going to take a lot of resources. It's going to take a lot of time. It's going to take a lot of energy. It's going to take a lot of money. It's going to talk, take a lot of action. It's going to take consistency. Um, but if it's worth it, if it's really truly worth it, um, then the motivation to give of yourself abundantly and to be able to notice the second guessing and notice the hesitation and continue acting in the service of your values and your goals, even if those things, or even when those things happen you are more likely to achieve your goals. And while the outcome may not be perfect and the path might not be perfect and, um, or, you know, any of that, you might not even achieve like that, that initial vision that you had in the end might be something different, completely different or slightly different from your, from your original vision. But if you have dedicated yourself and dedicated your thoughts, words, and actions to the betterment of yourself, to breaking the hesitation cycle, to getting out of that stagnation and making your dreams a reality and you know, bringing more peace, love, and joy into your life, the more, um, the more that you are going to get out of your life in the end. So... For this exercise, what I really wanted to share with all of you is my big dream and my big vision, because as I was developing um, Afafwa and the courses, I um, what I what I was what I tried to communicate, what I tried to convey was the bigger picture that you know this the vision that i have the mission that i have is bigger it's bigger than continuing education courses it's bigger than behavioral science it's bigger than myself it's bigger than my community it's you know it is really a deep down i care so deeply about people and i care so deeply about helping people live lives that are healthy and happy and productive and full of peace and love and joy to because i believe that as humans we have the right and we should expect 
that that is what life should be like. That is not to negate the fact that there are, there's, you know, a lot of pain and suffering in the world. There are a lot of people in this world who do not see the, see things the same way and who only act in accordance to the value of self, you know, self aggrandizement and um, things of that nature. Um, or who, you know, they're, you know, the world is full, full of, filled with people who are, consumed by their personal history of trauma um, so much so that you know they can't see the forest for the trees they're so lost they're so um, you know guarded and broken and hurting that and and hopeless like feeling hopeless and helpless but the um, but I see you know, that the bigger picture of the world and my place in it and um, you know, looking back, being able to look back at the historical data you know, that predates me and my personal existence and considering the future data and kind of what the end aim is for humanity's existence, it gives me hope for what I do and gives me, um, gives me great um, motivation to continue working and striving to be my best self and to share myself and my story with the world in the effort and in the service of helping other people um, understand themselves and make changes in their lives and communicate more effectively and kind of break, you know, break the cycle, break the chain, break the, um, you know, break the cycle of abuse and um, to live more fully with, you know, with their themselves and positively, more positively impact their own lives and the lives of others. So, um, so I've shared a little bit about, you know, my history, my history of you know, exposure to substance abuse and domestic abuse. Um, and we are now living on Prince of Wales Island, which is a, you know, the fourth largest island in the United States. And on this island, there are about 5,000, between five and 6,000 residents. And on this island, there are 12 communities. And we live in rural Alaska, and there are no problems here that are not happening in every other corner of the world. There uh, there's a um, you know poor education system. There's lack of infrastructure. There's lack of health care and mental health care. There's lack of effective treatment options. There is a history of economic insecurity where you know big industries would come into the area and create a boom of economic development and then um, as those industries were you know had whatever they you know were having challenges or there was less um, need for whatever product was being <clears throat> um, created so in this in this environment um, logging and commercial fishing and mining are like have been the highest in or the biggest industries, but there have been challenges in those industries. So as there's you know less less big trees on the island to log, then you know logging is less. As there is a push for you know not for more sustainable and renewable resources outside of our timber industry then our, that industry has gone down. The commercial fishing industry has been impacted by 
overfishing and unsustainable fishing practices. And so the commercial fish, fishing industry has declined. And so, you know, as you, as you have these peaks and valleys of economic um, security and then economic insecurity due to the ebbs and flows of industry, there is you know, this undercurrent uh, in this community, and I'll talk about just my community in, in, in specific because it's the one that I know, but I, I believe that the things that I'm seeing are broadly applicable to the world as a whole. So as people become less economically secure, um, you know, that causes pain and suffering because people don't have access to the things that they need or want or, you know, they've become accustomed to a certain way of living and having access to certain things. And because they had this amount of money, um, steady income, and then that drops down. So they're less able to provide for their families, which puts their, you know, puts their brains and their bodies in a stress state. And when, when our brains and bodies are in a stress state, that um, triggers our, um, our autonomic nervous system, which is our fight or flight, our fight, flight, and flee system. And so we've got, you know, our, our brains become overwhelmed with um, these you know, painful stimuli that then um, triggers a response pattern of escape and avoidance. And escape and avoidance in this environment where there's, you know, little access to um, the, 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 well, there's little access to much and people live very kind of like private, solitary lives. Um, that, so the economic insecurity and the difficulties with the um, education system. So we have that economic insecurity. We've got poor, you know, poorly educated individuals. Um, that has led to high rates of substance abuse and domestic abuse. Um, so we have a high rate of poverty. We've got a high rate of alcohol and drug abuse. We have a high rate of um, domestic abuse, both you know, um, physical, emotional, psych, um, financial abuse going, you know, going on in in our in homes across the island. Um, and the problem is, is that it's not it's not getting substantially better and the challenge that i've seen having now lived here for three years is that the the people who are on the island who care very deeply who want to do good and who want to help make changes are do not necessarily have the skills abilities or resources to make the changes that they see necessary in an effective and efficient manner so changes don't commonly happen so i've been involved in a variety of community agencies um, both on the business side and business and education side of things on the island and the pattern that I see is that there are um, a lot of people who are motivated to do something different, but they don't know what that different thing is. So they continue to try to come together, talk about their problems, talk about all of the things that are going on, but don't necessarily have any solution. So we have a lot of we have a lot of issues that we've talked about, but we don't have any specific solutions that we can enact to solve the problem. 
And so, you know, day after day, month after month, year after year, decade after decade, we have this, you know, the same problems over and over. And there's, you know, maybe a little pocket of hope and change over here, but it's short lived because nothing else is changing. And so um, it leads to that, you know, hesitation and um, stagnation and just kind of go back into our old patterns of behavior. So change takes a lot of energy and a lot of resources. Um, but when you don't have the right infrastructure and resources or the right allies to bring that all together and to create a, you know, create an actionable plan which is going to effectively address all, you know, the myriad issues that we're dealing with, um, then any change efforts are going to be short-lived. So, you know, there's going to be a lot of effort and a lot of energy put into one thing for, you know, for as long as possible. And there might be some changes that happen, but in the long run, though, you know, we're going to make some changes and then everybody's going to get tired and burnt out. And then we're all going to throw up our hands and be like, oh, okay, I can't go anymore. I can't, you know, I can't advocate. I can't take any more steps. And, um, and so then, you know, then those changes either, you know, we, we've progressed a little and now we're plateaued again, or we've progressed a little and then things stop and we go back on and decline. Um, and that, that has been the history of this community. And I've even, um, I've even looked at the data that is statewide in regard to these very deep systemic issues. And even though more money has been thrown at these issues, there has been little to no change, and even insofar as things have worsened. And so my vision and my motivation and the thing, the thing that I care most deeply about is creating and creating not just an organization, but this is kind of my idea is to create the Alaskan Oasis, which is a wellness retreat and transformation center, um, which can be kind of a hub for the communities on the island to learn about behavioral science, learn about um, how to take more effective action in their lives. Um, to effectively treat substance and domestic abuse because there are no good treatment options. Um, to, I, you know, my goal is to work with businesses to teach business owners about organizational behavior management and behavior systems analysis and how to more effectively um, run and manage their businesses and work with employees. I want to work with the school districts to help them learn about how to more effectively address the needs of a population of students that not only is dealing with just the natural, you know, the normal things going on in their lives, but in Alaska, we have much higher rates of substance abuse, domestic abuse, and, you know, suicide rate and poverty than a lot of areas, just kind of given the nature of our communities. And so, um, you know, a lot of the children in our schools are um, dealing with or suffering from adverse childhood experiences that impact their ability to get the most out of education. So it becomes this cyclical problem. And so my goal with Alaskan Oasis and with Apapua and with these courses is to really kind of develop a community of people who really care about and understand these issues at their very core um, and to then bring um, bring into my either my scope of practice or into my area into my area with allies um, to create a model that we can use to demonstrate the impact the positive impact of behaviorally based interventions on the education system, the business um, or businesses or community organizations, 
our health care, our mental health care, our substance abuse treatment, our domestic abuse treatment services. Um, and so my goal is to positively influence as many lives as I can and reduce the impacts of substance and domestic abuse on the island. But more globally, what I really envision is that um, that this island community, which is kind of a, you know, almost a perfect laboratory type environment where we can actually demonstrate the, the effect and the impact that these interventions, when done in a very thorough, thoughtful, systematic way, can create a world in which more people are living happy, healthy, and productive lives, and more people's lives are filled with peace, love, and joy. And once, you know, once we're able to demonstrate how to move through, like with behavioral science, how to move communities like this, right, from a state of, you know, constant pain, suffering, and chaos to a more kind of ideal, you know, an ideal state, where um, you know we're using and impl implementing behaviorally based strategies, not just at the kind of, um, intervention level, but everybody, right? As more people understand themselves and human behavior and how you know why we do the things that we do and how they can affect change in themselves and others um, more effectively and efficiently, I truly believe that there is. A, there's an opportunity to demonstrate that power and create a model which could then eventually be replicated to other communities to affect change in a more um, effective manner. So that is so this, these are my, this is my goal. This is why I do what I do. This is the, um, the, uh, the vision behind Afafwa is to create a community and disseminate the science of behavior to as many people as possible, inspire and empower and uplift people to begin taking action in their own lives but then also on a make more global scale, take this idea of, you know, that we're going, that we can save the world with behavioral science and actually create a, um, create a model which will allow us to teach others how it's actually possible. So taking it from just talking about what we're what we can do and how powerful it is to actually taking action and giving all of you know giving all of your energy all of my energy to this um to this endeavor to help bring this vision and this idea to fruition and however far i can take it right this is where my you know my 60 year plan comes in so however far that i can take that idea and you know, training and, and bringing in people and creating a network and a community to bring this idea to fruition. And then with the goal being that we've you know, built something that's so strong and so um, well functioning that it doesn't matter. So I can, you know, I can die and drop off and other people will you know, join in the fort, join in that effort and continue carrying that idea and that mission forward um, until we have truly reached that final destination that I, that is you know the um, embodiment of what it means to um, you know be a human and um, for us to live live the lives that um, the you know the the structures that we've had we have in place within our society say that we are entitled to and this is a way for us as behavioral scientists to take that idea and that vision that's kind of nebulous bring it together and put it in a form that can be 
shared more effectively. So we are at the end of our time. Um, hopefully uh, the sound, it sound, looks like the sound was um, got better. And so hopefully you're all able to hear me. If you have any last thoughts that you would like to share, please do. I just wanted to bring up the um, homework for this next week is to read the chapters for lesson five, um, to continue your uh, daily NTT routine. And then, then one of the next uh, flips is the blessed to habit. And so this is the idea that's in the um, psychological flexibility literature as well is, you know, when we approach our lives with this attitude or this idea of I have to, I have to do this, then, you know, it's almost this sense of like, it's a begrudging, like, oh, I have to do this thing again. I've got to get up. I've got to go to work. I've got to wash the dishes. I've got to change the diaper, blah, blah, blah. Um, so when we approach our day and we approach our life with this attitude of having to do things, it can um, demotivate and disconnect us from what really matters. But rather, if we have a, you know, we um, take on an attitude of, I choose to do this. I choose to take this action because it's in alignment with this value. Or I'm blessed to. I am blessed to do this right now. I'm blessed to change this dirty diaper because it means that I, you know, I'm being a good parent and I love my child and I care about their health and well-being. Um, even, you know, even in those bad times when, you know, we, um, you know, things don't feel that great when you, when you kind of, uh, interrupt that response, that negative have to, and redirect it to a more positive, I'm blessed to, I choose to, I'm doing this in the service of my values, utilizing those motive mantras can help kind of re, um, kind of reorient you to your higher purpose and keep you moving in the right direction um, because you're doing something that matters for you. So I'm gonna stop there and I'm just gonna open it up if anybody has any last thoughts that they would like to share. Otherwise, we will sign off.